Well, and when we did a project with people living with dementia, we were using a lot of rosemary. Um, a lot of weddings use it for symbolism, for love and loyalty, um, patience. And um, I was this morning just thinking about, and especially on the remembrance level of... Um, Nothing to do with COVID as such, but we've lost quite a few participants over the last year. Um, not to do with COVID, but to do with other illnesses. Um, and I just thought it might be just a nice way to mark mm, this moment for those wonderful people that we were able to spend time with, wherever they are now, that we can have a moment to remember them, but also remember anybody else that we feel we would like to remember. But I suppose it's also remembering your inner self as well. That was, that was just one for me. And um, for those of you that know that I've had a bit of a uh, tricky shoulder, so the last couple of weeks has been a real um, test, and I think the universe has brought it to me some way or somehow to remind me to just chill out a bit <laughs> um, and to reanalyze and to rethink. So I'm going to give you all a little section sprig. of sprig, a sprig, a sprig, a, sprig. Yeah. a sprig of rosemary and you can do whatever you wish with it you may want to put it in a stew tonight or you may want to put it under your pillow i'm going to be putting mine if i put it in some water will it grow some roots try it. so so it's a, so, so it's uh, so it's edible it is Oh, oh. I usually put it well. My husband hates the smell of rosemary. I think my dad would. Um, he, he loves the spices. You'll find what to do with it. If you, if you take one of the leaves, one of the little, the little uh, leaflets, and, and rub it between your fingers and then smell them, you get the real sense of it. <laughs> oh, it's 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 great. It's it's yeah. Well, there you go. Oh, mm. Drop some uh, Helena on the grass. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Try and grow some of that. A fussy, fusty judge craned forward, sneering contumeliously at duffer duff defendants, punched obsequiously in the dicky dock. He was a piteous, pitiless paradox of a man, fantastically physically frail, yet ostensibly omnipotent. Twig like Bigwig was the pretty putty epitome of petty. Insufferable hubris suffused his sibilant essence. Hoity toity lord verbosity was pomposity personified. Half cut he hurrumped <laughs> hyperbolically, <laughs> then bellowed pernicious paragraphs of cacophonous balderdash from his capacious thesaurus. <clears throat> you verminous cress dross hyperloy hobbledy hoys. Are charged with a capital crime, that of using a double negative in a sentence, a double negative, an actual guff. How terribly unintelligible! In fatigue, he brayed extemporaneously. But we never done nothing, <laughs> my lad. Opined the rat tatty, belittled illiterate. Quite. <laughs> Quipped the smug sot, whip it quick, peremptorily quaffing a tot. Our despicable despot's didactic rants were apparently arrogant, apparently errant, apparently abhorrent, <laughs> and idiotically, idiomatically, idiosyncratic. <laughs> Being unusually delusional, he believed himself to legally be an antecedent of a split infinitive and the definite article. Frequently, as a fanatical child, he frantically played pass the past participle, <laughs> while phonetically sounding off about phonetics. Mum and Dad were palindromes, <laughs> though he called his parents brackets. They were only see, thinking that they were his parentheses. <laughs> he actually was a pronoun. <laughs> and someone once saw the judgmental curmudgeon serve a conjunction with an injunction without compunction. He severely deemed full stop to be definitively dotty and definitely fear T, so it didn't cross it. Puffed up. Pipsqueak considered contractions, infractions, and slurring absurdly perversely averred that he'd heard the silence of dropped H's. Noel, Noel, forever endeavoured to be clever by punctiliously putting prepositions in appropriate places, presuming to pop on a matapier when it appeared to disappear. Preposterously, this finicky fink seemed impossibly possessive about his apostrophes, and was even odd about an oxymoron. 
implausibly the octogenarian contrarian both adored and abhorred antonyms, or synonyms he saw as right and proper. But mark you, our staid buffer would oft see or hear homophones here. A number of pithy figures of speech did give him the pip, though we always swore he never swore. Furry dirty curmudgeon spurted fruity lines and inserted squirted peach marks as inverted commas. A feet, fetid, fatted, was circumspect about the fate of a fated circumflex. He admired sonorous as assonance and consonance as much as similes. Our floundering fiend was found to founder, for he faint heartedly feigned affection for font, yet affected a fondness for few forms of faint. Commas commonly caused him to pause, ominously comatose. So excruciating was his infatuation with punctuation that the scoffing boffin bit of more syntax than he could eschew. <laughs> Thus he was constantly constipated by consonants, avowedly disemboweled by vowels, vaguely plagued by problems with the colon. With his heinous plethora of precious pretensions and superciliousness strewn in ubiquitous abundance, few perceived that this supposedly perspicacious person, or specious, duplicitous, dichotomous, whatever. <laughs> he extracted a closet cockney geezer, a good blimey, white boy wannabe, barreling and gobbling down bow back streets, bantering with barrel boys, using the most spectacular vernacular he could muster. A clandestine predilection for calamitous slapdash diction was an addiction. Who would have guessed that this unprepossessing obsessive possessed a repressed desire to knit a natter non-stop with a bottled up over the top glass stop? None knew of his renunciation of enunciation or his denunciation of received pronunciation. Visibly discombobulated, the accursed accused sought a sabbatical from a smatter of matters and a grammatical. You pleading innocence! are guilty of incoherence, an indefensible offence, yet still look more complacent than complacent, snapped Sniffy Toff. It is my discontented contention that contemplation and unconditional contrition are beyond the ken of your completely incompetent kin. What a contemptibly incontinent contingent, an incongruent contaminant. Henceforth, you are to be incarcerated for an eternal spell, he yelled rapidly and rapidly, by way of a blatantly belated explanation of the exclamation mark. Even when he sent them down, he sent them up. Can you, misbegotten non-entities, even spell, spell? He queried rhetorically, twixt awful guffaws. <laughs> <laughs> Wordlessly viewing their endless sentence to a prism of prison bars, misery was the lot of the few. So, a, f a few, um, a f now a few of these poems I had, um, I had recited in the Beyond the Border Festival, but s for those who might not have been there, I'd just uh, like to share it with them. So, uh, um, some I just picked. Now, this one is called We Are the Fairy Tale. By this, it's all about how you um, what what fairy tale character you think yourself as through your life and personality and all that. So everyone is a fairy tale. Everyone is a character. As an autistic, I am a puppet. As an autistic, I still learn what is right and what is wrong. As an autistic, determined to reach triumph, I am a real boy. What fairy tale are you? next one is called The Fall. So, as I mentioned in the poem, I'm a person with autism, and there are certain things which I can find overwhelming, such as if everybody was to talk to me all at once, don't know who to talk to, and and I, and I like, find some place to just drop and let everything sink in. So this is the um, description of what goes on in my mind when it all happens. Things get, things get too much. 
Things get overwhelming. Things overfeed the mouth of my head. My head is false, false, fed false annoyance, and then suddenly, I collapse. I fall through a portal to a new universe. I fall, and I fall, and I fall, as my fiery brain douses every flame. Suddenly, I am floating. I am floating back up as the world from where I have fallen from starts making sense. Yet, voices in my head welcome me back. But I ponder, who is talking to me? Now, um, for those who uh, haven't heard this one, from, who, and who haven't been in Beyond the Border, I just want you to know that, that you, might, you might find yourself getting a bit emotional over this. It's based on a dream I had, based on real events. The poem is called, I Met Her. I was in the annex, and there she was her very spirit, in a beautiful white dress, and best of all, her beautiful long hair restored. The conversation fogged out, but she was a wonderful girl as we pictured her to be by reading her words. I first viewed the dream as a sign that she knew her dream had come true to be an author, but a much better idea was shared, to let everyone know that she is okay now. Um, just um, three more now. Um, this one is also based on a dream I had, but a lot, but more um, light, but but a lot more uh, pleasant. Mm -hmm. I had a dream once that they that they were that there were no humans, but bears walking all over the planet, going about their business. Mm -hmm. Waking up, I thought to myself, how nice it would be if we were all bears like Paddington. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, now th this one is called Next Time. Uh, but at the beginning of the summer holidays, I had auditioned for The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, run by National Theatre. Unfortunately, I did not make it into the second round, so to, to, um, re to release um, the, um, the uh, disappointment I felt, I um, cheered myself up through what I wrote here. Focus your mind upon the event of next time. If I fail, I must look to the sun and remind myself you have to fail before you succeed. Until then, you have no option but to force a smile until next time. Smile at all times, because next time is closer than you think. And the last one is called You Never Grew Up, and this is right up Karen Street. <laughs> As children, we witnessed the magic of wishing wells, stringless puppets, fawns ice skating, miracles of believing, dogs forming spaghetti kisses, dancing monkeys, flying elephants, the power of pixie dust, beauty within, the balance, the circle of life, going the distance, and the journey on a magic carpet. Adolescence is dark, scary, and disturbing, but these adventures are what, we keep, are what keeps one strong, and that is why you found the way through, grow, through growing up. A trademark of childhood that means more than just for entertainment, but to parent you through your life. You never grew up to begin with. The last, the last time we were in the chapel, I did um, a piece about somebody that counts words in oh, books. Yeah. Uh, some people might remember it, and this is um, an extension of that work. Um, a few years ago, I started writing a novel, and I never got very far. <laughs> but this is some, some excerpts from it. Um, this week I counted 26.3 books, six fantasy novels, four biographies, four detective novels, three romance novels, two mathematics textbooks, two children's books, one erotic fiction, one car manual, one self-help book, a western, and 30% of a German language horror novel. I have kind angst. My German's terrible. <laughs> I've eaten seven lasagnas and conversed with four people. The postman, Enzo, Patrick, and the man who bought 103,326 word fantasy novel. Patrick says I must try and speak to more people, but these are the only people I saw. I asked him if the amount of words I'm saying is the most important, or the number of people I say them to. He told me that I should try and do more of both. This week, I said 406 words. Next week, I will say more. I'm not scared. 
If a man who bought 103,326 uh, 103, word fantasy novel comes back, I will ask him if he enjoyed the 103,326 103, word novel. If he did, I can suggest some similar sized books. I have an American book on American presidents, which is 103,334 words he would enjoy if he's willing to spend the extra three seconds reading it. <laughs> I will probably avoid talking to people I've never spoken to. I think it would be better for me to improve the word count on conversations with people I already know. This week, I said 406 words, 324 to Patrick, 35 to Enzo, 28 to the postman, and 19 to the man who bought the 120,326 word not fantasy novel. Next week, I will say more. At the moment, I can read faster than I can speak. Patrick says that I need to speak more but I cannot speak with people who I do not see. Tomorrow I will try and speak with the postman. I will ask him how many letters he posts and if he counts the addresses. Patrick says it's good to take an interest in other people. <clears throat> there have been over 130 million books published in modern history. Every year that number grows by an average of two and a half million. Patrick has taken me to Latasca tonight. He doesn't often come with me. I have been there longer than 20 minutes and he, uh, when he comes with me. Uh, I, have, I have to be there longer than 20 minutes when he comes with me. Patrick is not a distraction to my work. He also distracts Enzo from his work. It would take 96,000 years for me to read every book. But every year, another uh, 1,843 years worth of books gets written. Sometimes I wonder if I need to hire another member of staff. Patrick has opinions on how I should run my shop. I tell him how many books there are and it would take me 90, uh, 96,000 years to read them. But I don't tell him that I'd like to hire someone to help me read them. I will have lasagna. Patrick orders spaghetti bolognese. He reads the menu first. The menu has 430 words. He used to have 500 words, but Enzo wrote a new one last year. I don't know why Patrick reads the menu. He's been here 116 times. He ordered the spaghetti bolognese on 82 occasions. He'd been here 116 times and he always reads the menu. Patrick asks how much I have taken this week. The answer is 43 pounds, 29. And I sold 120,290 word science fiction novel, one 33,403 word, uh, word children's book, a Cheech and Chex book, of 273,409 words, and I also sold a short children's poetry book with 1,497 words. Patrick does not seem pleased, but I tell him, if this is more than I usually sell. Patrick tells me he's concerned I, that I do not have an infinite supply of money. I tell him it would be impossible to have an infinite supply of money. He tells me that he wants to help me in the shop sometimes. Patrick has a degree in geography. He works as a primary school teacher. The average amount of words he reads is 240. He can help a little, but I know Patrick will speak more words than he will read. It is long after 5.55 p.m. I think about it. Uh, just think about it, Patrick tells me. I can help out with the customers and maybe look at ways to make more money, just on Saturdays and during the school holidays. The first printing press used movable type it was invented by jo um, Johannes Gutenberg around 1439. If Patrick helps too much, there will be too many people in the shop, too many pe t people touching and moving the books. It is 5.59pm. I have not eaten. I have not read in 15 minutes since Patrick arrived in the shop. Patrick does not like me to bring books to Latasca when he visits. Patrick visits once a fortnight, but we do not always go to Latasca. Sometimes Patrick comes when I return from eating. It is 6.02 and I still have not eaten. Do not blame Enzo or the chef. What do you think? Patrick asks me. It's six or three, I say. Patrick looks at his watch. I've just told him the time. So it is, he says. What do you think? Uh, so what do you think? Can I help? It will take 96,000 years to read 130 million books. You can help read then. Okay. We, need to make, we need to get you making more money, Patrick says. It's six or four, I say. Patrick says my name and looks directly at me. Patrick is, one, uh, Patrick is 31 now but I've known him since he was two days, four hours and ten minutes old. It is approximately 20 seconds I would have ordinarily finished eating. There are on average 2,500,000 uh, 500, books published annually around the world. Patrick says he just wants to help. He claims he's a duty of care towards me. 
It is 6 or 7 p.m. I still have not eaten. I do not blame Enzo. I do not blame the chef. Neither Enzo nor the chef may feel the need to read the menu before ordering the same as I, they always eat. Unless Patrick was counting the words. It has, 4, 000, uh, it has 430 words, I say. Jean Lacar, click, click. 15,012, don't look up, don't lose track. The girl who touches books came in the shop 14 seconds ago and I went to straighten for three, uh, and went straight for the 30,000s. Not sure what she wants. Don't look up, don't lose track. 15,101, don't look up. Excuse me, she obnoxiously shouted. 15,182, don't look up, don't lose track. Finger down, don't smudge the page, don't mock the ink. Hello, I didn't look up, I won't lose track. She wants a book, she says. I tell her it's a bookshop. She says she knows. I wasn't sure she knew. She is vague. I don't know what it's called, she says. I don't know either, I tell her. Don't look up. Don't lose track. Don't smudge the page. Don't mottle the ink. 15,399. It was my grandfather's favourite book, she says. I consider for a moment that I might know him. I really only know a few people. Enzo, but he isn't old enough to have a granddaughter that age. Patrick, and he has no children. And I know the old woman live, that live next door, but that isn't her grandfather. Even thinking about these people, I don't know their favorite books. I don't know him. He's dead, she says. 15,523, don't look up, don't lose track. The voice is too loud. She's looking at the 50,000s now. I can remember the cover. It looked like a painting by Picasso. 15,777. What's the word count? I don't look up. I think she might be angry or confused. I don't lose track. It's okay. I'll look myself. She started walking towards the hundred thousands. Don't look up, don't lose track. 15,906. She starts pulling at the box. Don't look up, don't lose track. I try to keep reading. 320 words per minute. The pages are going, uh, the books are going in the wrong places. That doesn't belong there, I say. She's not listening. Don't lose track. My finger smudging the page. Don't look up. <laughs> 15,906. Please, miss, I get up. I drop my book. I was on 15,906. I pick up my book. <coughs> she put back the 112,000 in with the 113s. Don't lose track. I found my place again. I bookmarked the page, flat across the line, the last line. I put my clicker down. That's the 112,000, I say, but she's not listening. It was a novel, she says, touching everything. Why does she have to touch everything? Mm -hmm. An old novel, maybe from before the war. How many words is it? I don't know, she says. Why does it matter? I need the word count to find it. She tells me I'm absurd. I don't understand. I'm the opposite of absurd. I'm highly logical. Mm -hmm. These books are in word count order, I explain. This is 112,491. That's science fiction. You should have, it, have a section for science fiction. People want science fiction books in a science fiction section. She pushed the book back in the wrong space. I don't know why she did it, did it the way she did, but she was not kind to the book. 112,491. I put it next to McTeague by Frank Norris. I'll, I'll sort of, it's sort of like a science fiction book, but not quite, she says, immediately proving her own suggested system to be faulty. <laughs> I can't help you, I say. It wasn't very long, a bit shorter than average. The shortest story is six words. Largely attributed to Ernest Hemingway. The longest is Artemine by George de Scudery. It's 1,954,300 words. Have you read it? Yes. Is it good? It's in French. I don't speak French. <laughs> but you read it. I just said I read it. <laughs> but why would you read something when you don't understand the language it's written in? Especially when you must, it must have taken you months. Took me exactly one week. What do you mean by average? She walked off and picked up a paperback <coughs> from the 60,000s. Like this, she said. 63,422, Virginia Woolf. About this long. If it's that long, and I have it, you will find it there. I put the book back on the shelf. 63,422, Mrs. Dalloway, Virginia Woolf. She walks to the 60,000s. She touches the book and I wonder why. Sometimes I have several copies of one book. Unless it's the same pressing, I read the duplicate, duplicate copies as occasionally there are some changes in the word count. There are four copies of Mrs. Dalloway, two editions, same word count. The girl rummages around the 60,000s. 
I stand near in case I pro- uh, in case to protect the box. She touches everything, and the voice is too loud. Sixty-five thousand two hundred and uh, two hundred and nine. Sixty sixty-six thousand and sixty-one. Sixty-three thousand and nineteen. Her logic is absurd. The writer has an odd name. Sixty-four thousand two hundred and seven. I look at the clock. I look at my clickers. She touches the box. Huckle. Sounds like Huck. 63,766, I say, as I pull Aldous Huxley's Brave New World off the shelf. There are three copies, all different editions, all with the same word count. That's it, that's the one. She starts jumping. She takes it off me and pushes herself against me with her hand around my shoulder. She says thank you three times. 63,766, Brave New World, thank you, she says for the fourth time. The voice is too loud. Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, 63,766. She picks one hand, uh, she picks the one with the cover she likes. I look at the clock, I look at my clickers, don't lose track. Six pound 37, I tell her. She smiles at me in a strange way and moves her head from side to side. She has a tiny purse and fingers that are too big to get the money out. I look at the clock, I look at my clickers. I'm approximately 3,200 words behind schedule. The girl pays me in money and leaves. She's wearing green, a green cardigan and has blue eyes. The end. July the 2nd this year was the 60th anniversary of the death of the writer Ernest Hemingway. I dedicate this story to his memory. The old man and the books. The boy got up from watching the television which was rather antiquated and had a black and white picture. This had not mattered as the film was set in the 1930s and looked authentic in black and white. He went into another room full of the dirty gray of newspapers and sagging furniture. The boy's mother had turned the new council house into the state of squalor that existed in every place in which she lived. Picking up a magazine, the boy learned that the film had been based on a story by Ernest Hemingway. The heavy feeling of Sunday night with Monday morning ahead now lay on the boy. He was 13 years old and did not want to go to school the next day. He had not wanted many things. He had not wanted to leave the Forest Valley and live in this council house. He had not wanted his father to die two years ago or for his father's last words to him to be a whining reprimand spoken from behind an oxygen mask. He had not wanted their huge German shepherd to be killed by lethal injection on the kitchen floor to suit his mother's convenience. And he seriously wished that his brother, who was nine years older than the boy, would die. His brother had been the source of pain, cuts, bruises since the boy had been the age of three. His brother was clever with his fists and clever with his words, doing his best to poison the boy's enthusiasm and destroy his dignity. And his brother did other things. He was not large enough or strong enough to overcome his brother in a fight, and the boy often wished he had the courage or the sheer ruthlessness to kill his brother with a knife. The boy did not go to school the next day, and instead he bought a paperback copy of For Whom the Bell Tolls, Ernest Hemingway. He went back to the valley in which he had grown up and sat on a hillside above it and began to read. The clear April sky was bright and pale and the dry brown bracken lay on the slopes up and up to where the hillside met the sky. The sun was hot but without the heaviness of summer. It was the same time of year in Hemingway's novel. He went on reading and paused at times and wondered. Here was Spain, but not the Spain of his mother's ignorance, in which the Inquisition tortured jolly English sailors, and it was not the Spain of suntanned lotion and vomited up beer that his brother had visited twice. This was the Spain of mountains and forests and dedication and danger and defiance. Even more than this, the boy would look up and think, How does he know? It's as if Hemingway has been inside my mind. The book described things that the boy had felt, 
Hemingway wrote about the smell of darkness, the way your thigh muscles twitched with fatigue after climbing a hill, the taste of watercress picked straight from a stream, the way that fear made the sweat run down over your ribs. Hemingway also wrote about sex, but the boy knew nothing about that and had to take it on trust. Yet on that day, he decided that he too must become a writer. The boy grew up and became a man, and at 19, he felt he had no particular reason to go on living. He read and reread Hemingway's books, and like Hemingway's characters, he felt the fascination of death. He tried <coughs> to kill himself with a large overdose of drugs and came very close to succeeding. No one made the man go to Northern Ireland where there was a civil war. He just decided to go, as Hemingway just decided to go to Italy and to Spain. One day, he turned back towards the Falls Road area in Belfast, going down one of the side streets and finding it full of soldiers with rifles. Some of the soldiers were stopping each car that passed and checking inside it. Other soldiers were crouched in firing positions on the corners of the street. In an instance of cold, flat certainty, the man realized that the soldiers were expecting to be fired on from the Catholic flats overlooking the street. The nearest soldier to the man crouched with his rifle trained on the flats. The soldier saw the man's shoulder bag and shabby military style jacket and his beard and long hair. The barrel of his rifle shifted slightly to a point more towards the man. With a clarity that surprised him, the man knew that the best chance of surviving was to go on walking slowly down the street towards the soldier, keeping his hands in full view and making no sudden movements. He was getting very near to the young soldier, whose eyes were wide and dark. The soldier had a fair complexion and was probably ginger-haired under the combat helmet he wore. His face was drawn and twitching, with the effort of watching both the windows of the flats and the man simultaneously. The street seemed to have become silent. The man could feel the soldier struggling to decide whether he was a threat, and he could see the black, abstractly black, muzzle of the soldier's rifle. He looked away from it. Now at least six soldiers crouched in firing positions were looking at the man and watching the block of flats at the same time. If someone up there decided to fire on the soldiers, he would probably be caught in the exchange of shots. At last, he reached the end of the street and turned out of it. Later, he believed he had Hemingway to thank for the strange detachment he had felt in that street. The man learned that the experts in literature, the journalists of literature, and the professors of literature were sometimes no more honest than the money changers and merchants that Jesus had driven out of the temple. They talked of Hemingway's boastfulness and silliness and gave the impression that he wrote only about boxing and bullfighting and big game hunting. He saw how a lie could be repeated and passed on until it was accepted as the truth. Little or nothing was said about how Hemingway could trace the tiny movements of the mind and emotions, how he could show you that no one is entirely good or bad, right or wrong, heroic or cowardly. And little was said about how Hemingway, at his best, could portray women at least as well or better than any man, any male writer who has ever lived. Still later, the man lived in Spain among people similar to the characters in For Whom the Bell Tolls. He saw the villages of white plastered houses with red brown tile roofs among the mountains and forests and with the bright bougainvillea spilling down the walls. He knew what it was like to make love to a woman he loved in the close pressing silken liquid darkness with only the ground sheet of a tent between you and the Spanish earth. Then he discovered for himself what Hemingway had told him long ago, that love can turn to hate in a marriage and nothing ever lasts. In the spring of the year 2021, the man was reading all of Hemingway's books again, one by one. But it was only when he heard it on the radio that he remembered that it was 60 years ago that Hemingway had killed himself, placing a 
a loaded shotgun against his forehead and tripping the trigger. Hemingway had been suffering from depression, but when he asked for help, the psychiatrist had destroyed his memory and his dignity by giving him electric shock treatment. If they had not, he might have drawn on the deep well of strength inside him and once again risen from the depths. The man was also suffering from depression in the spring of that year. There had been yet another failed relationship, another defeat in his life, but he did not try to kill himself. He kept on writing and working, and he knew enough to stay away from psychiatrists as severely as a fox avoids a pack of hounds. He went walking in the Welsh hills, carrying a picnic and a bottle of wine. Then he found a group of people who celebrated the spoken and written word and were meeting again after the pandemic restrictions. He found the women powerful and charismatic and the men decent, modest, direct. Altogether, the man felt as much at home with these people as Hemingway had felt with the expatriate writers in Paris a century ago. And one Saturday afternoon, he read them a story about why Hemingway matters. I started writing a collection of poems about some time I spent in China 10 years ago. And this is a poem about a guy, an American guy that I had a crush on. So it's called Justin. There you are, some blue sports jersey draped over your wide shoulders. Our first meeting is not a conversation, but an argument in a bedroom full of people. In our defiance, we make them feel so awkward that we usher them towards the promise of sleep. And it ends with a time for bed that leaves me wanting, though I can't tell what. I love to hate you. We tease each other. We soon have pet names. I call you America. You call me Wales. I take it for tenderness. I'll take any kindness I can get. There is a hole in my heart that is six feet tall, and you are just the right size to fill it, at least for a moment. It's a rebound. I knew it even then, but that doesn't stop me from falling just a little bit for the act, for the accent, the brusque way you bulldoze conversations, cheap hair gel, cheap cologne, obnoxious, almost a caricature, but it all seemed good to me. Sitting on my bed, we watch hours of television frozen to the same spot. I bask in my proximity to you, skin tingling, nerves burning with the closeness of our knees. We watch Game of Thrones, we watch Eastbound and Down, HBO hits. We buy knockoff Chinese DVDs from the marketplace and can't quite figure out how to get them to work. We quote Step Brothers, watch it with the group, and the synchronization of our glee floods my heart with warmth. When you're not around, I watch Freaks and Geeks. I dance my heart out to Joan Jett in the opening theme, and rivers of homesickness torrent down my cheeks. You are a type of home. You tethered me to something that I had missed. I lived for your smirks, understanding glances. Even though I could feel your lust, not for me, but for the Russian girls, Natalia, Vera, Magda. <laughs> And who could blame you? Their faces, bodies perfect, model-esque. Their self-esteem intact. They pitied you, batted you around like kittens with a ball of wool. But if I was jealous, I don't remember it. I knew I couldn't keep you, so I settled for what I could get. Then you told me that boys don't respect women who sleep with them too soon. The other men agreed. I was shaken, angry at the bullshit, and I haven't forgotten the reek of that misogyny. It will never wash off my brain. It was a turning point that I should have seen coming. You asked me for money. You called me the Bank of Donna while talking about your girlfriend back home who embarrassed you by working at the Dairy Queen. There were red flags by the dozen, I'll admit, but I was less blue with you than without. And then you spent the night. Do you remember it? My roommate was away and I had an empty bed. We both knew what was coming. At least I hoped, and it could have been so easy. I was ready, a flower waiting for the touch of sunlight to bloom, but you couldn't even afford me the decency of a kiss, the dignity of an embrace. There was no more act when it mattered. You slapped a handful of money on the desk, like I was yours to rent. The fucking audacity. <laughs> <laughs> it smarts now, it hurt then like a slap in the face. I retreated to the other bed, feigning amusement, but when I turned over, my eyes filled stinging with shame and disappointment. In the morning, you said that you wanted it to be our little secret. Fuck that. I told everyone, because I'm no one's shame but my own. Still, I felt for you. 
When we said goodbye, I felt a sadness so strong it almost bowled me over. You were stoic, said you'd visit if I sent you the money. I still think about you now. We are both married to the people we met after and you look content. But you snapped me out of my misery and into a new one. I wouldn't change it. Ten years on, I have long forgiven you, forgiven myself my weaknesses. I pity that girl and her longing, but I am no longer her. I am stronger for it, and through it, I have learned to shy away from the ones who hurt. Eighties music, what can I say? When I was younger, I would listen to it all day. Sunday afternoon, listening to the top 40. I would record the charts, it was always my go-to. I remember my first concert in the Hammersmith Palais, Depeche Mode. I loved every bit and was hooked on this musical phenomenon and could not get enough of it. Wham! Spandau Ballet, Sting and Culture Club, Howard Jones on Christmas Eve. My parents forbade me to go, but I went anyway. The Blitz Club in London with its new romantic scene, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood, collaborators of music and fashion like you had never seen. And then there was Madness wearing their baggy trousers and playing the sax, the specials in a ghost town, and Go West showing their pecs. Japan was such a cool group with David Sylvian at the helm, showing his forbidden colours he couldn't help. So let's try Cindy Lauper giving the girls some fun. Kate Bush were their hounds running up that hill. Duran Duran, where they sailed on to Rio, were hungry like the wolf, and Madonna took a holiday to get into the groove. And Morton Harkett from Aha, the video was the best it could get. The drawings that moved I will never forget. So when I've collected my UB40 in the past, I bought some red wine, it never did last and Pete Burns, who spun me right round with his big curly hair and swivelling hips. I would gladly ask Boy George for some good singing tips. For dinner, for dinner there was meatloaf and ZZ Top with long draggy beards, guitars and leggy videos to watch. So I've sailed with the duo I like from the start, followed by Pet Shop Boys, Yazoo, Erasure and Bross. Don't laugh. <laughs> I could talk about my favourite subject all day, but I'll give it a close now, I promise, OK? But before I leave you, I must just say this. Adam and the Ants, repeat after me. Marco, Merrick, Terry Lee, Gary, Tibbs and your true Lee. Hope he sticks in your head and you sing it all day. And rap it is called, 80s music is the best. <laughs> to do a story today um, and then I, I had a moment and I just went oh I just don't feel it so I brought this book with me today which is the book that kind of sat through on my desk through lockdown through all our story care and chairs in my little room early days lockdown and I just thought and I haven't I'm just picking bits from it to read um, so imagine this is like way back back in so it was this March last year when we thought we would just be locked away for three weeks. <laughs> so these are just a few little captions and moments when we had different facilitators. We had, I think these are ones with Rufus, Dom, Mel. So um, I'm just taking you back to my little uh, spare room that became the engine room of People Speak Up over a year ago. Oh, this was Alan Gibbard's workshop. The fresh smelling haze of number 44, silent, busy, heart beating. Old habits disrupt the silence, in the rabbit hole we go. Sit, avoid, as the haze of number 44 diminishes. This is with Rufus. Sun is shining, it's flipping hot. YPs, OPs, looking, speaking from a heart. Bonnie is a heart. She constantly steals my flipping heart. <laughs> OPs, YPs, looking, speaking, because it's flipping hot. And it was back then, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do we fight? Why can't we just all be one? Why do the politicians and the rulers continue to divide us? 
Why can people not see this? Let's come together without labels, just the contents, the best bit. Being here now, a ripped out woman of kindness. Value for money, is she? Faces, phone rings, the sun is blocked out, bobby blinds, paper stacked, nail polish chipped, rejected funding applications, a ripped out woman of kindness, that she is. My tree, strongly rooted, sometimes wobbly, beautifully bonkers, not full of conkers, green, moves through the air, she sits as she is seen, alone, she doesn't want to be, but never really fits in, wrong tone, she is the tree of spirits, my tree. Uh, during lockdown, I've been a key worker. Lockdown. One, two, three, four, I don't know what lockdown. But I've been um, somebody who delivers medicines and meals and things like that. And But lately, in the last few months, I've been aware of people who've been um, suffering from agoraphobia. Or if they're not actually in that, that condition, they're very close to it. I live in the centre of Swansea and it's a load of terraced houses and I asked my neighbour who lived there a lot longer than me for a name of an elderly person who lived alone um, that I could contact. She gave me a lady's name, Maureen. And Maureen is 88 years of age. She lives alone. She's got family in Swansea who she hasn't seen for 18 months. I contacted her by phone. It took a few phone calls to get her confident enough to speak with me and my suggestion mm -hmm. that we go out for a coffee together. It took an hour to get Maureen from her front door of her terraced house to walk to my car, which was parked directly in front. An hour. She was frightened. But she got to the car and then she rapidly withdrew. From there, we built up until Maureen was confident enough in her, in me, and my driving yeah. to go for a coffee outside. To make her feel better, I masked up. I don't wear a mask, um, but I masked up and did all the things to make her feel better. And from that, she now willingly comes to coffee. And from her, I've got two other elderly women who she knew but doesn't know. She gave me their, their details. So now I've got three elderly ladies that I take for coffee outside, rain or shine. And what they have found out about each other is that two of them were meant to go on the SS city of Benares. And the SS city of Benares was a, a ship that was sunk in 1940 by a submarine, a German submarine. And out of 100 children, only 13 lived. Two of these ladies were supposed to be on that ship. And it was only illness that stopped them going on there. But what came out of that was that all three of them were ev evacuated to Hirwain, mm -hmm. up in the valleys there. And one of them, the one who wasn't supposed to be on the SS Benares, said, well, there was only one bomb ever dropped in Hirwain. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the other ladies said, I'm so bloody stupid, there was a munitions factory there. <laughs> and the other one said, that's right, there were loads of bloody bombs. And then the argument <laughs> started. <laughs> How many bombs were dropped in heroin? <laughs> but Maureen, the first lady I saw, said, well, I don't care anyway. I was oofed out of that and I ended up in ghost last. <laughs> Pretty damn spooky that. They all speak Welsh there, mate. <laughs> and I said, oh, good, good. Did you learn to speak Welsh? I know a few words, but I can't mention it over coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so SS, City of Benares, uh, stopped the programme 
of children being sent from Britain to Canada and America. Um, and they were then evacuated in, in the British Isles themselves. And thankfully, those three women that I, I see regularly now and are quite happy to leave their homes still argue <laughs> about how many bloody bombs dropped in heroin. I can tell you there were a few. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not here to strut the stage, to act the fool, to play the sage. I haven't come to read my will complain about the bills, deliver the latest instalment of my best-selling, block-busting, heart-wrenching, ball-breaking, one take, whoops, there's a mistake, talk amongst yourselves, stapled out of the wrong order, about an unnamed lover, smothered in sugar, its tail twisted, unfinished, sure to be shortlisted, master bakery, masterpiece, I don't remember writing that, <laughs> um, no, none of that. Just hello, nice to be back. Read the one you wrote on Wednesday, Mike. Read the one I yeah. Which Wednesday? The Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Another child on the way from Margaret to meet. Karis went to the Gower walking, making me ask why, purple feet. Caroline's car boot is broken and beeping down the street. <laughs> Donna took her kids to the cinema. Oh, what a lovely treat. <laughs> Louise saw a beautiful connection between the young and old. Beth saw her grandchild, a new story being told. Karen had a Mackey D's, a cheeky little treat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, Pete changed up a few things and discovered a new voice. Steph had buns in the oven. Oh, what a tasty little treat. Lee's <laughs> uncle wasn't doing well, but made it to his feet. Yeah. Anthony jumping on the bus to travel down the street, wanting to go places, new people to meet. Val's grandson passed his exams with some great marks to, now on to the next stage, what will he choose to do? Now to me, it's just about a good night's sleep. One night without being disturbed, oh what a lovely treat. <laughs> Sometimes I sing my poetry, and as it's such a beautiful day, I'm really in a park with trees. It's just up my street. So I'll sing a poem that I wrote in two parts whilst walking on the mountains near where I live. And in the night, in the dark, above the village. And as the lights in the village were coming on, the owls were calling and the stars were appearing. It was black and all the bushes and the trees were becoming silhouettes. It was very beautiful. The bats were flying around my head. And you just feel that you can't sort of climbing and climbing away from everything, from your everyday life. It's a very beautiful feeling. So this is a, what I wrote about it. Slugs are sleeping, moles are awake, their tunnels reaching across the
Bye, Storm.